Hello everyone, it's Kais again, and welcome to the first proper devlog for Circle of Orion, the uh, turn-based RPG that I'm making in Unreal Engine. The uh, last devlog was meant to be more of an overview of the project, kind of talking about the direction of it, the purpose of it, but this time uh, we're going to be delving into the project itself, so let's go. This month I've actually gotten a ton of uh, groundwork already done. Got story, uh, a lot of that done, got art tests done, been working on gameplay systems, integrating different systems together, been working on prototyping, the dialogue systems, a lot, a lot of progress, and uh, yeah, I just want to show you how it's all been going. So I gave sort of an overview of the story last time, but I kind of wanted to go uh, more into it now. On the surface, it's sort of a typical uh, isekai plot where you have the, you know, person in uh, modern day, and then they just end up in a fantasy world somehow. But the twist here is that uh, the people going back now are, you know, the teenage hero character, but also uh, their mother comes back with them as well, and their mother is the actual protagonist of the game. The idea of the mommy Sakai is something that has been done before, but uh, putting the debatable quality of that aside, the direction we're taking is totally very different. This is meant to be more of a, a knowledge is adventure, which is why I've used the Narnia comparison, because that's actually a lot closer when it uh, with the story of, of family members just going into this fantasy world together. Meaning, I also want to take the story and relationships a little more seriously, more sort of go into what they actually would be like. And uh, with that, this being a turn-based RPG, party members are a uh, big part of that. So Ellen is the protagonist. It's mother in her, say, late 30s. Uh, she's trying to race her teenage son, Leo, after her husband passes away. And one day, the two of them end up whistle away into the fantasy world of Orionis. There, they end up on all sorts of adventures while they try to find a way to get home. The overall plot is pretty much already outlined, and uh, I know where the, the main story is where that all goes by the end, especially. Um, and right now, it's a lot more about uh, I'm trying to, trying to get into getting specific beats and specific uh, events, towns, dungeons, and then integrating... Uh, character moments because right now the story is more just about events, but I really want to, to keep the focus on the on the characterization. When it comes to character design, uh, as a matter of fact, I actually uh, prefer to do most of the designs and coming up with the, the look of stuff myself. I tend to use sketchbooks. In fact, I tend to use sketchbooks primarily. I, I enjoy digital art, but I'm really not. I don't enjoy making it as much. It just doesn't feel quite the same to me. But I really like sketching out character designs or outfits or maps and stuff, that, doing that mice just in a sketchbook by, by hand feels a lot nicer that way to me. One thing that's been a, a big help for this and just for creating the overall look of the game has been I sort of rediscovered Pinterest earlier. I used to use it a long time ago but hadn't thought about it. Um, and then I just sort of started using it again and then pulling all sorts of reference images um, for characters, for the world, for the specific events and, and dungeons and bosses, enemies, and it's proving to be really great. Uh, Pinterest, the combination of Pinterest and Milanote, sort of visualizing the project and also being able to present it to other people to show kind of, hey, here's what I'm going for. It helps keep a cohesive vision. For the environments, uh, I'm kind of going for a style reminiscent of uh, Genshin Impact, and so as a result, I've ended up using a lot of the same uh, asset packs that I used in my remaking Genshin Impact stream, but I'm planning on modifying them a bit more to kind of fit with them more, with more, more cohesively with the uh, art style I want to go for. And that started with uh, making my own grass shader, which took a while, and it's not 100% perfect, I don't think, but I'm actually really happy with how it's turned out. Uh, basically, I, I, I have kind of the ground and the grass all be a nearly a solid color. There's a little bit of texture, but for the most part, they're kind of just a solid color. Then I kind of turn off shadows, and then I have a um, sort of a mixed or randomized gradient where, where the grass sort of starts the same color as the ground on the bottom, and as you go up, it just gets a little bit lighter. So it creates this really nice gradient and this really nice sort of a variation of grass. Uh, for characters, right now I'm using my uh, character anime or anime character pack that's on the Unreal Engine Marketplace. Initially, I found a Genshin Impact shader on ArtStation, and I pulled that, bought that, pulled that into the engine, and started putting it on stuff. It's a really cool shader if you guys want to check it out. I found, though, that my own shader kind of worked pretty well. 
um, actually gave me some more control, and so I've, uh, I'm gonna be sticking with that. Because I think it just works better with the way I've made the characters, so. On the topic of characters, one thing that's obviously super important to games like this is the party members, the party that you collect and travel with, and the difficulty is trying to decide on the kind of the size of the party. Because it's kind of nice to have lots of party members, you can do so many different designs, you can have a lot of variety. But especially for the scale of a, the game I'm trying to go for, um, mechanically and story-wise, it becomes a bit of a hassle to try and manage uh, a large number of party members. So right now I'm thinking of around six, like five or six main party members, and then depending on how development goes, depending on what time I have, I might add in some optional party members, because that's something, uh, especially like JRPGs now, don't do as much. You used to see that a lot more. After party members, probably the biggest, most important thing that uh, people uh, looking for, you know, turn-based Japanese-style RPG uh, want to know about is the battle system. It's like one of the main draws for a lot of games like this, especially turn-based ones, is like, all right, what's the battle system? What's sort of, what's the gimmick? What's the catch or the, the idea? behind it, you know, what makes this one unique. So nailing that battle system down is is additionally super important and is probably gonna be the most difficult part of this uh, for me because I have to do a lot of a lot of work on designing and then iterating and balancing and all that sort of stuff. For the battle system, um, I just started by uh, adding in my turn-based combat asset pack uh, that is on the marketplace if any of you want to pick it up. But that's, yeah, what I'm going to be using as a base. I haven't modified the actual battle system itself too much, mostly just some of the aesthetics like camera angles, camera animations, and then creating the specific animations for battle actions and stuff like that. So it's, it's creating those asset packs is, is definitely proving to have saved me a lot of time. One thing that helped a lot with this and is helping me a ton in general is Control Rig, which is uh, something that's not super new to Unreal Engine, but has definitely got a lot of improvements in Unreal Engine 4 and 5. What's super cool about it is that you can take existing animations, like stuff you pull from the marketplace or made yourself, and edit them directly in Engine. So what I could do is I essentially took a lot of attack or skill animations uh, using uh, primarily Frank's uh, action animations pack, I'm not sure what to call it. Essentially, I, I take, say, an animation from him, then I reverse engineer and control rig, where I just pull back the root bone in the animation, and it gets the effect I want. It's really cool, and it saves me a lot of time having to create new animations, because I can easily modify other ones. And what's doubly cool is that you can set up a rig to where it'll essentially reverse engineer the animation onto a special IK rig, so you have full control over modifying how you want it to move. As I'm designing the battle system right now, I've broken up um, magic and like non-magic skills into two separate categories. And one thing that, that's nice about that is with magic, they essentially all play the same character animation and just have different particle effects. So I went ahead and got this magic circle asset pack off the marketplace and put that in the game. And it's really cool how it essentially lets you modularly build different uh, magic circles that have different lifetimes or different animations and stuff. It was also about this time that I started getting sound effects in for both UI and for different uh, actions in the game because that's one thing I think really helps your game feel like it's coming together even if it's super early on, is getting sound in. Sound is one of the things I think can, can do a lot to save the feel of your game, even if other elements are weak. If you have really great sound, that can do a lot, at least for the sensory experience, making that more enjoyable. I also started work on a new asset pack for the marketplace that I am planning on integrating into Circle of Orion, and that's for battle transitions, sort of making modular battle transitions inspired by all sorts of different games. I'm not sure when that'll come out, but it's definitely something that I'm working on, so just keep that in mind. When it comes to the battle system, I think the last thing is that I'm really trying to figure out what gimmick I want. I feel like every, not every, but most of the more memorable JRPG battle systems have some sort of gimmick to them or some sort of specific feature that's unique to them. Like you know, Final Fantasy VII has Materia, Trails games have the Orbment system, which is kind of similar. Chrono Cross has its weird elemental system. 
You have like Zeno Gears, which has its special input system. It, and it's not always one gimmick, but you know, it's sort of one thing that, that helps your battle system kind of stand apart. And I'm trying to think of what I want for that. Initially, I did design a job system for the game. I planned it out somewhat extensively and started implementing it into the game. But as I was working on the story and the mechanics, it just, especially with a party of more than three or four characters, it didn't feel very good. It wasn't coming together in a way I was happy with. So I've, for now, scrapped the job system, and I'm trying to think of some other alternative while still keeping that sort of uh, customization in, in character development. As for out-of-battle mechanics, I went ahead and uh, created a new component for inventory and added that to my party game system. For anyone who's used the party game system, which is on the marketplace, it's the one I'm using here, but I integrated the inventory directly into the game system itself, and I decided to change that and move it into a component so that I can stick it on other things like uh, chests or just other areas where that can store inventory that you can get as the player. And I'll probably be turning that into a component for the actual uh, marketplace asset as well. When I will do that, I'm not sure. Hopefully sooner rather than later. One thing that was really useful was editor scripts. I actually created a few editor utility tasks for pretty much automatically generating a bunch, like potentially hundreds of data assets at once, just so I didn't have to go and manually create those and tweak their settings. It worked out pretty well. I actually was able to uh, create a system initially where items, like specifically weapons, were able to determine their own stats just by the weapon name. I actually had a big bug for a while where when I opened the inventory menu in the party, in the pause menu, it took like a good second and a half to load anything. And this would be for the inventory menu, for equipment as well, or any time that I called items from the, the party system. It was proving to be really frustrating because I was worried that I was doing some really terrible, per that I had screwed something up and basically destroyed performance, and I was getting really worried, like, uh-oh. It turned out that I just was calling a bunch of pure functions and wasn't caching the result, so every time it ran a for loop, especially a for loop that had like 100 items in it or something, it was going through each one of those pure functions uh, recursively, and it was massively stacking up performance, so I, I can see why that was a problem. So I essentially just cached out the result and it immediately fixed performance and everything went fine. So yeah, no to anyone, if you're doing a lot of pure function calls, especially pure function arrays, just be sure to cache the result, otherwise you will probably create a big pain in the neck for yourself. As we started getting towards the end of the month, uh, I started working on the sort of dialogue and cutscene system. For creating the system, I've been using Logic Driver Pro, which is, as a lot of people have acknowledged, yes, it's got a lot more expensive since I first made that video on it. It's $200 now. And I acknowledge that it's still a fantastic tool and one I strongly, strongly recommend. It may not be necessary for you, so just keep that in mind. I'd try the light version out first, but I've used it for virtually every project of mine, so it's, it's definitely gotten its money's worth. Even if I had paid the $200 that it is now, I would have gotten my money's worth. I did for a brief amount of time consider using an alternative for dialogue called the Flowgraph plugin, which is actually free and open source, uh, and I'll put a link to it in the description below. It's it's really great, and what's nice about it is because it uses uh, essentially data assets for flow graphs instead of blueprints, the performance time in an editor specifically is super fast, and that's one of the main reasons I considered using it initially. It's great, but it turned out to have too many restrictions, especially when I was trying to create dialogue options and dialogue choices, uh, and like dynamic uh, variables as to when it comes to conditions and like what options should be allowed or what options should be skipped. It didn't really allow me to do any of that stuff because it was a data asset, not a blueprint. So I ultimately decided against using that and stuck with Logic Driver. But it is still available for any of you who want to use it Especially for those of you who want to have a branching dialogue system but can't afford something like Logic Driver Pro, then yeah, check out Flowgraph Plugin. I'm a little torn right now as to whether I primarily want to rely on custom dialogue or whether I want to use level sequences for cutscenes and stuff like that. Because the way Unreal Engine works, level sequences are a lot easier to set up and to use and to modify, I think, and you have more direct control over. 
but because you're creating a sequence you have it kind of takes more time i feel because you have to do a lot of uh fine tuning while dialogue uses a lot of presets scripts to run scenes and functions i would sort of it's it's sort of like say look at something like persona versus xenoblade persona uses a what i call a dialogue system while Xenoblade uses cutscenes or sequences. And those are sort of the two styles of doing them. From an outsider that may not seem like much of a difference for a programmer, it actually does make a pretty big difference because it fundamentally determines the way you're going to be setting up scenes. As cool as the idea of having full animated cutscenes like Xenoblade is, I'm probably going to not go that direction, partly because it's a little out of my uh, range with what I can do right now, but also I just like the traditional style of having the character portrait in the dialogue box with a mostly static camera. I just think that style it weirdly has a nice sort of feel to it and allows for a lot of unique ways of uh, telling the story. But I do want to know what you all think, whether you prefer the more traditional persona dialogue box style or you prefer something like Xenoblade where it's you know every scene is a some extent is a is a quote-unquote cutscene. Uh, with all that said I have been going through this devlog for a while now and I uh, <laughs> have not been addressing the elephant in the room that being a little uh, game developer event happened this month. I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't heard of it it's not like it was a big deal it was Unreal Engine 5 got released baby! Summer Engine 5, look at all the lumens, look at all the nanites, all the particles and the things you can do. Oh my goodness, it's the Matrix. These Play-Doh characters, they look so real. Everyone loved the Matrix movie, right? Hello, I'm Tim Sweeney, and I'm here today to talk about why losing 12 billion Bitcoin a day is actually a sign your business is doing amazing. Anyway, point is, Unreal Engine 5 got released, so naturally, everyone starts moving their stuff over. Uh, except for me. So Omega Game Framework, I initially uh, ported over to Unreal Engine 5, and turns out, even though it ended up on the marketplace, for some reason no one could download it. I do not know why, but it was just unusable. So I ended up having to delist it, and then figure out what the heck was going on. And honestly, I still don't know why it wasn't working, but eventually, I got it resubmitted to the marketplace, and the Omega Game Framework is now available to use with Unreal Engine 5. So as a result, I basically wasn't able to get any work this month done in UE5. All right, initially when I was writing the script that actually was true, but turns out I had a few days left and I did get a fair bit done. Well, when I say I get a fair bit done, I mainly mean I got converting over to Unreal Engine 5 largely done. And that mainly included changing over to world partition so I could use data layers instead of sublevels. Because previously, the zone manager system, which controls the different zones you travel back and forth to, used different sublevels to load in and out different zones. Uh, but I really like the data layer system more, so I ended up switching over to using that. I also started making use of the game features plugin to sort of break up each of the chapters into their own game feature plugin. And what's nice about that is because of the way dependencies with those works. It basically makes it impossible for me to accidentally reference any core code or any events from the other chapters in a plugin where it's not supposed to be. So it essentially forces me to design the plugins or the different chapters modularly in a really nice, uh, clean way. So I, I'm, I can work safely knowing that there's not going to be any bad dependencies or bad references. So it's really great. But that is about everything that I got done this month. So yeah, it's it's... I've been really happy with what I've been able to get done. It's nice that Unreal 5 is finally out and I can make use of the new features. I'm wanting to start ending these devlogs by shouting out another game developer and their project. So for this month, I want to give a shout out to The Outbound Ghost by Corn Radical Games. This guy is creating a JRPG as well, though it's a little bit more of a Paper Mario meets Bravely Default. Uh, kind of style. He did an interview with Thomas Brush, the creator of uh, Pinstripe and Never Song. If you want to go over and watch that, they talked a fair bit about dealing with publishers and just getting started on your own studio and games and how to go about that. His game is made in Unity, not Unreal Engine, so that might be a little bit different from what a lot of my audience is familiar with, but I think it's it's super still super cool to see 
what he's doing. Yeah, go and check out the Outbound Ghost. Looks really cool, really fun. And uh, with that all said, that's all for this time. Uh, for next month, I'm wanting to finish a proper outline of the entire story and, and get started on the script and prototype events for at least the first chapter. See if I can get a horizontal slice of the entire first chapter basically done and ready to go so I can potentially have a very, very basic playable version of the whole game done by the end of the year. Not obviously very polished or anything like that, but where it's technically in a playable state. That is the plan for now. With that said, thanks everyone for watching. I appreciate any feedback or any comments or anything you guys uh, have to say. I hope you really enjoyed that. To all the other game developers out there watching this, best of luck in your projects, and I will talk to you all some other time. See ya!